people who care, working day and night, equipment the most technical or the most simple, this is all part of Montana's effort to maintain a diverse and balanced water resource. Preserving water and our future will require a tremendous effort by those responsible for its protection. Most important, this effort will depend on active public support. After all, water is among our greatest treasures. It is a wealth that belongs to all the people. These rivers are ours to enjoy, ours to protect. History is taught by virtue almost always of how we exploited a place. And yet when we ask people what they value, they value most what we nurtured and preserved and restored. It was in the 1950s, like 1951, that the Dingle Johnson Act passed that taxed fishing equipment to put the revenue towards fisheries research and management. That produced the first generation of biologists who were trained to critically analyze what the problems were and work towards uh, solutions that uh, would produce sustainable fisheries. And uh, within, within a year, we were running up and down the highways with slide projectors showing the damage being done to our streams and with a little bit of data that we collected quickly, uh, the impact that was having on fisheries. As Montana was being settled, we put a lot of stress on our aquatic systems. I was kind of surprised at how many different places there were that, and different types of things that we were faced with. Uh, there were three people basically on the field working on water quality back in those years. We had the Clark Fork laying dead from Butte clear on down to the mouth of the Blackfoot, the Big Blackfoot, and that river lay dead for a century. The big dikes and the bulldozers and the dewatering of the river and the fish kills were a huge issue and that's why we had to form the chapter. So we had a lot of problems and uh, it was not illogical that efforts to plant fish were being offered as at least something that we could do. Yeah, when they started stocking fish in the Madison, for example, I noticed there was a huge change because all you catch is those damn planters. They put so many of them in, and uh, basically the same thing on the big hole. And so it was it just uh, decreased the quality of fishing considerably. When the whole river fish population project was set up, hatchery fish were actually not an issue. It was actually to have a tool to determine if we change something was worthwhile. When we went with the idea of not stocking fish, people became real angry. They're going, you're going to ruin this river. People actually threatened him with violence and sabotaged his gear. He didn't set out to change the world, but it was such a monumental change that it scared the heck out of people. It's an interesting phenomenon as a state fish biologist to really, you know, bust your ass for the resource and then just be hated by the public. Sometimes the commission finds itself in difficult positions where the science is telling us to move in one particular direction, but the popular sentiment related to that direction is not quite there. I kind of liken it to going to uh, maybe downtown, somewhere in West Virginia, and telling folks that the coal mine's not good for them and we ought to try it different approach to economic development and um, you know what they did is turn the Madison and all of southwestern Montana's fisheries into some of the best fisheries in the world. People believed, myself included, that this was the way to go. This is how you manage trout. If you stock trout and fishing got worse, stock more trout. Fishing got worse yet, stock even more trout. 
not a solution. Uh, I think once you have wild fish and you recognize that if you don't take care of their home, you don't have fish. So now your mind says environment is important. And I think that was a big change. Prior to wild trout management, people didn't even think about what flows were. Here it was Montana Power jumping flows up and down, half dewatering the river. No one even hollered. Once you had wild fish, they changed the flow 10%, people start hollering. So that tells me that wild fish caused people to be more interested in the environment. Can the lives of our rivers be saved? Can these waters continue to feed the land and renew the human spirit? Will yet another generation celebrate the life-giving energy of our rivers? If we evade these questions today, they may never be asked again. I'm Jeff Laszlo, and we're standing here on Odell Creek, which is a tributary to the Madison River. For the past decade, uh, there has been a significant restoration project here on the upstream section of Odell Creek uh, to fix a, a degraded condition that had been the result of draining and grazing and natural erosion. Uh, when, when your ecosystem is healthy, uh, everything thrives, and that's particularly important for wild trout. Uh, wild trout are the virtual uh, canary in a coal mine. If something's wrong, they'll tell you. If something's right, you see amazing things. We're seeing a tremendous increase in spawning and fish populations, um, and that's of great value to both the Madison River and everybody that uses the Madison River, whether it's for recreation, fishing, agriculture, uh, hydroelectrical generation. Uh, it's all about preserving these really unique and critical resources. Doing this kind of a project, which now includes 11 miles of stream channel and thousands of acres of wetlands restored, uh, can't be done alone. It has to be a collaboration. And we've been very, very fortunate that uh, we've had great partners and people who bring expertise and talent and knowledge to this, including Trout Unlimited, Ducks Unlimited, uh, Northwestern Energy, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and, and many nonprofits such as the Trust for Public Land. So it's, it's not only a great example of technical restoration, but it's a great example of uh, collaboration to solve really challenging problems. Patience sometimes pays off. That's a wild trout. His bigger brother's in here somewhere. Yo! Right That's it, man. Look at the tail on that thing, brother. Uh, there's a certain amount of habitat in a, in a stream that uh, can be occupied by a wild trout or a hatchery trout. And if you put a lot of hatchery trout in the stream, uh, you can force the wild trout out. It costs quite a bit of money to raise a seven inch trout, which they were planning. And does it make any economic sense to do that if they don't last for over one year? And we determined the fact that uh, it did not. And because of these both, both studies, it, Montana developed a philosophy uh, and a policy of not planting uh, hatchery trout into streams unless there was some uh, adverse impact that, that it had occurred where it had to restore the population. When we're talking about wild trout policy in Montana, we're really talking about the legacy of Dick Vincent. That legacy is one of ecosystems protected and restored, but even more than that, it's the legacy 
of creating now one of the strongest departments of fish, wildlife, and parks, one of the strongest fish and game departments in the United States. And that's a result of Dick Vincent's vision and the decision to embrace wild trout management. We talk a lot at the Office of Tourism about let's not just drive more visitation, let's drive the right kind of visitation. If you want to go to Disneyland and do the concrete thing and do the rides, there that's going to be there for you. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a very important part of um, our economy is to have all kinds of, of experiences. But this is really something special. And we often talk about we don't need to be all things to all people. So not being all things to all people is really thinking about the big picture and focusing on the balance and everything that's in the balance. And with very few exceptions, oh. the fishing today is better than it was 30 years ago. The things we're working on with Trout Unlimited here in Montana really derive from that key decision to embrace wild trout management. That decision led to a whole cascade of decisions to invest in the health of Montana's streams and rivers. So it's really not an exaggeration to say that wild trout management affects every Montanan's life, whether they know about trout or not, because all of the water policy advances that Trout Unlimited has worked hard for stem from that decision to embrace wild trout management. If you look at the evolution of the angler, we initially start fishing because we like to eat fish. And we ultimately fish because we want a relationship with nature. And we go to wild fish because we want that relationship to be honest. Thank you.